Please welcome on stage Jonas Skelberg, one of the co-creators of Skype. He is a respected lecturer, author, and a venture investor. Jonas is currently a part of BCG Digital Ventures, a corporate investment and incubation firm dedicated to inventing, building, investing, and launching category-changing businesses at startup speed for the world's most influential companies. As one of the founding partners of Skype, Jonas was a part of the internet's biggest businesses, a simple innovative idea that revolutionized and disrupted the telecommunications sector. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please put your hands together as we welcome on stage, Mr. Kelberg. Thank you. Thank you everyone, super happy to be here. Um, so honored. Thank you very much for a great introduction. So, um, who am I? You heard a bit about my resume. I'm Jonas Kelberg. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur, investor, author. Um, today I'm going to take you through a bit of the perspective. How do you build game-changing companies and how do you deploy new capital? Um, as you heard, I had the great joy of showing up to a small shitty company called Yoltid that later became Skyper and then ended up as Skype. But besides that, I've also uh, invested in quite a lot of companies. Um, I invested about 400 million euros into a company called Salando that sells shoes on the internet. I thought this was a great idea. No one really agreed with me, um, but it turned out to be okay. Now it's listed. But I also invested nearly 100 million euros into an Indian company called Jabong didn't turn out as well. I also just realized that they had the worst advertising you could find. <laughs> so maybe that was a really good reason. I maybe should have done a bit more research around the investment department there about the marketing. But maybe that's something they can catch up with. I also invested in um, the biggest classified in Russia, Avito, and Home24, West Wing, and HelloFresh, all listed companies today. Um, besides that, I've also started more than 50 different companies. Um, most of them you haven't heard about because most of the things I touch actually go to hell. But three companies I started was Player.io, Ken Networks, and Anuba. I sold all of these companies to Yahoo. So if you ever have a company that is not working out, call Yahoo. Because with a bit of persuasion, they buy everything. The problem is probably they're not around tomorrow, but that's a different story. But as, as you heard, besides that, I'm also now working for the Boston Consulting Group. Um, I'm also uh, in the Digital Advisory Board for IKEA, now trying to help them rethink their perspective, and now opening their first store here in India. But as you hear, <clears throat> my life has always been, how do you change the game? How do you take a perfectly working business model that some of the largest corporations have and destroy it? That's my passion. That's why I get out of bed. Is there something we can destroy today? Because, let's face it, if you have a lot of revenues and a lot of profits, with new technology coming around the door, could you challenge it? Could you rethink it? So that's my perspective. But I think, <clears throat> starting off here, I think it comes down to a fundamental question. And that is, is it the big companies that will beat the small, or is it the fast that beat the slow? Because let's face it, most companies are really big. And my challenge has always been, how do you rethink the perspective? Because in the companies where I've thought, the fast beat the slow, they've been you know, really big and successful sometimes, but in the other cases, the big companies have actually beat me. So the paradox here is, most of the time when I fail, it's because the beat big the, beat the small. And this confused me. So if we just do a quick hands uh, up, you know, if I would say, you know, is it the fast that beat the, 
Is it the big that beat the small, or is it the fast that beat the slow? Hands up for fast beat the slow. OK? Not as many hands. And the big that beat the small? Just one hand. All the others is like we're totally indecisive. <laughs> well, we play both. We'll play both ends. But okay, for me, this was confusing. So after I uh, sold Skype, I uh, had the opportunity to go to Stanford. And I spent three years here trying to figure it out. And it ended up with me actually sell, uh, publishing three different books about the topics. And I'm going to take you through some of those parts. So when it comes to investing, these are the three or the nine different gears that originally was developed at Harvard and then was brought by Tom Kosnick to Stanford. And this is what they teach at the entrepreneur school, uh, at the <coughs> technology school there. And I'm going to go through three of these gears today. And as you see in the centerpiece here is customer acquisition. Because this hit me really, really early in my career. I had the opportunity to start out as a very, very young CEO. But what the only thing the board cared about was growth. That's, you know, I spent five years at the university and I had no clue about sales. You know, I spent most of my time trying to think out how I would do strategy. Ended up in a corner office, did a lot of slides, but this is where it hit me. Have you ever thought how easy it is to add customers in Excel? It's a very brilliant tool, huh? And when I started here as a CEO, this company was not growing at all. And it became just more and more apparent that I couldn't really figure it out. But luckily, I had an old friend who had a friend who had an old friend who actually was the CEO of a large corporate in the US called NCR. And I was super happy to meet this CEO. You know, he had started as a sales guy and now ended up as the CEO. And he gave me a small brochure that says, Du måste, du måste knacka på hundra dörrar, talk, talk, prata med tio personer för först att få ett tack. That was in Swedish. Basically saying you need to knock on a hundred doors, talk to ten people before you get one yes. And I was like, what does this have to do with it? You know, I'm, I'm the CEO, you know. This has nothing to do with me. But then he just looked at me and said, you know, read it, Jonas, and you'll figure it out. And I was an engineer. I went to computer science class. So I loved math. And this was for me an epiphany moment. You do 100, you talk to 100 people, or you knock on 100 doors, you talk to 10 people, you get one yes. You do 200, you sell more. It's not complicated. We have a conference for three days here. It's math. And then we can be a bit more complicated and we can talk about how do we include frequency? How can we really, really include it? But in the end, you put a couple of extra zeros here, so it probably trickles down. So then you can do this better and you can really optimize. But in the end, it's all maths. So when I talk to a startup and even large corporates today, I often always think about customer acquisition as a math problem. And I think you should think to yourself, have you put your best engineers trying to unlock growth? Because if you want growth, this is where you need to show. And I can be honest, in all the successful companies I've been part of, they have all innovated in sales. Is this something you walk up on stage and tell people about? No. This is one of the most guarded secrets of any company to find the imperfection of driving new customers through the door. And with all the things that are happening and all the change, you can see how much AI is driving this. I take a math approach on everything, you know. We talk, Hans Paul talked about how Starbucks have now gone to a segment of one when it comes to deploying mathematical use of propensity models. What are you going to buy tomorrow? So if the first lesson of driving capital is you want hyper growth, so you need to know how to unlock it. So that's lesson number one. 
Lesson number two is basically delight. When I say the word delight, what comes to mind? Anyone? Yeah, love, great things for customers. It's, uh, it's about, I think, you know, how many have heard about the word unique selling proposition, USP? Anyone? Ah. Basically, this is another perspective of it. We've taken this from the hierarchy of customer needs. It basically works like this. At the top, you have delight, then you have efficiency and functionality. Maybe I can give you an example. Alfa Romeo had a very strong delight in design. Is there any Alfa Romeo in owners in here? It's not very common in India, is it? Huh? But if you had design here, the problem here is that if the car doesn't go from A to B, the delight falls, huh? because the functionality is not there. Let's talk about another example, Volvo. What was their delight? Safety, huh? What is it today? Chinese. This is interesting. This is the Swedish Nokia moment. We don't really want to talk about it. But the interesting thing here is for me is more what actually happened. During a period of time, Volvo added a lot of safety features and customer satisfaction increased. But what do you think happens when all cars are as safe? It becomes a functionality. And I think this was the same with Skype. During a period of time, we innovated in the way to communicate and we real thought how a telco would actually work. But today, most services have the same function. And here comes the caveat. There's no customer going to walk through your door and tell you what we loved with your customer and with your product before today's commodity. That is the challenge. And I'm quite amazed. I, I today have the, the opportunity to, to meet a lot of boards and stand in front of a lot of CEOs through my job through BCG. And I'm still amazed how little time and energy they are spending on innovating tomorrow's delight. And how much energy is actually all about trying to fix the functionality and the efficiency. Why is that? Because we're all talking about the future. The whole conference is here about thinking about tomorrow. And yet, most CEOs and boards spend so little time. I can go to a startup conference, and everyone wants to change the world and has a very strong vision, but they have no money, no organization, no firing power. But the largest corporations I meet, they're all so focused on trying to make their existing business model a bit more efficient. I'll tell you why I think it's difficult. Because innovating in tomorrow's delight is about reimagining the future. It's about thinking tomorrow. What is tomorrow going to look like and how am I going to act today? Because in the simple perspective, it comes down to defining what is your friction-free storytelling? Because often when I meet these boards, I only have a very simple question. What are you selling? How often do you think I get the straight answer? It's often, well, well Mr. Kjellberg, it's a very, very difficult. We are a big company. We are very, and what we do is very, very complicated. We have more than 200,000 people. And I'm saying, okay, but you're 40 people around the table. If you don't know what you're selling, how should the rest of the 300,000 people know what they should be doing? Well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's complicated. We guess we're getting most of the money from the Swedish, from the French government. And then I'm like, okay, I, I'm out of here. But uh, that's a different perspective. But it's a, it's a simple question, but it's very, very hard to answer. And that's what my define as the light. And I, I learned this very early on because. I had the great opportunity to have Stefan Passion, 
one of H&M's founders in my board very early on, and he talked with great passion how difficult it had been for H&M. Because H&M was a fashion clothing company as everyone else, until he one day decided from today on, we're going to be a fashion company with a zero less on the price tag. Very simple. We're going to be a fashion company with a zero less on the price tag. If Gucci has supermodels, so do we. If Prada are on Fifth Avenue, so are we. If Yves Saint Laurent takes $300 for a pair of jeans, we'll take 30. But from today, we're in a fashion company, and we're going to act like one. And they redefined the model that no one believed in, doing cheap fashion on high street. But if you go back and look, what did they do? It's been a magnificent journey for them. Huh? But a bit later, another company starts, and it has outgrown H&M. Which one? Zara, Inditech, correct. So what did they do? What is their friction-free storytelling? It's, we're first with the latest. They don't see themselves as a fashion company. They see themselves as a logistic company. Because when HMM was all about trying to make their supply chain more efficient, Sara said, let's increase it so we can increase the turnover time. Then I invested in online retail. Salando. They don't see themselves as a... Their friction-free storytelling is, we dress code. It's a tech company. has nothing to do with fashion. But when I was in the board, I was a bit disappointed because I thought everything they did at Salando and Jabong, you know, was apparently quite ugly. But then I, I talked to the head of fashion, and the head of fashion, she was also a former BCG colleague, and she just looked at me and said, Jonas, never ever underestimate the bad taste of Germans. <laughs> because for her, everything was just one gigantic Excel sheet. It was all about trying to understand what is the customer going to buy. Because you can display 16 different products on a website. So it was more about understanding what is the propensity for you buying what? And if I have no data about you, I will serve you with a cowboy boot in plastic. And then it was all about trying to figure out what are you going to buy next. So, we talked about the two fundamentals around this. We talked about growth. You can talk about you know, it's AI, continuous live dialogue, it's data-driven, behavioral targeted. It's all about, you know, defining. We talked about, you know, innovation, incubation, it's about product market fit. But fundamentally, it's building the best product in the world. Unfortunately, there's a third building block. For me as an entrepreneur, life had been so much easier if you didn't have to have a business model. So, innovation in the business model. I had the great opportunity, as you know, joining this small company. And the first thing we had when I joined was more about, okay, we're selling IP telephony. It's basically calling from A to B. It's not that complicated. A lot of other companies have, have done it. So it's more like, okay, how do we price it? And then it's okay, let's be a bit, you know, analytic here. So I put together a very clear benchmark of looking how international calls had been, constantly gone down. So I said, based on that, there's only one logical thing to do, and that is price it to zero. And everyone else is, who brought this idiot along? How are we going to make money on us? I said, I don't know. The only thing I know is that prices are going to go to zero over time, so we need to price it to zero. And then everyone said, like, can we fire him directly? And Niklas is like, do you know how difficult it is to recruit nowadays? And I'm like, yeah, thank you, guys. But then Niklas said, maybe, maybe we should hold the thought there. 
what do we need to do different if we want to keep that customer promise? So we started the innovation in zero games, saying that if we wanted to price it to zero, we needed to rethink the way we did business. So we said, let's benchmark it against the telco. So a telco loves investing in infrastructure. But we said, let's use the internet that the customer has already paid for. We found our first zero. Second, a telco loves to invest in phones and hand out phones. We said, let's use your computer to code the calls and send them out. Third part, to get really, really good voice quality, you need to buy a lot of Cisco routers. By the way, how many here use Skype? Cool, that's a lot of people. How many used Skype before Microsoft destroyed the product? <laughs> that's cool. Can, can, ah, there's someone really waving down there, yes. Uh, can you remember when you were early on had Skype? You had the client on, you left, you came back a half an hour later and your computer was super hot and the fan was blowing at max? Because what had happened then is that your computer had become a super node and all traffic was routed through your computer. Because we came to the conclusion there was a lot of CPU power connected to great internet, but not being used. And we said, sharing is caring. <laughs> all government building, big banks at night, you know, so much computer power not being used. Sharing is caring. Luckily, we didn't have a legal department that could help us out in this situation. So, customer service. At this time, I'd run about three different telcos, and I knew customer service was a very, very expensive cost. But our challenge when we talked around, my, my, especially mine, is after I called Vodafone, I was more often disappointed before after the call than before. And we shared the same thought, you know, you were happy, you called customer service, and then you were sad. Meaning there's a negative delta by calling a customer service. And we said, we don't want to have a negative delta. So we said, let's make it impossible to call Skype. We took about away our phone number from our website, you know, we didn't have business cards, we just made it impossible to call us. Then we come to advertising. What does a telco do? TV, advertising, radio, print, you know, all the most expensive stuff, buying football teams. We were poor, we were, didn't have that kind of money. So we said, we need to rethink our perspective here. So how do you build it? Because let's be honest, Skype is great because it has a network effect. But in the beginning, it's an inverted network effect. Like basically, no one gives a shit. So how do you grow this kind of service? So we came up with a small perspective. What happens if we make a small recommendation pop up? After you've had a good call, there was a small pop-up saying, hi, would you like to recommend this service? And if you clicked on, I would like to recommend it, since we were a downloadable client, we went in and we opened your Outlook, and we sent a mail to all of your contacts, <laughs> saying, hi, I've just started using Skype. I would like to call you for free. This is my username. We sent quite a lot of mails when HPC, IKEA and these large companies started using it. So we had zero cost for advertising. Do you think we were proud about this? We went out on telco and conferences like this and told them, no, we were like, no, it's just a pro perfect product market fit. And then people say, yeah, but how weren't you caught in all these spam filters? 
No problem, because it was only one person sending one mail once to all of its friends. Zero cost for advertising. And then you can be a bit more philosophic about it, and you can also talk about, okay, Tom Kosnick that I've written the books with, he actually started research around, you know, the innovation in zeros. Started at Harvard for long ago. And if you can go, there's quite a, some interesting articles at the Harvard Business Review about how you build, because if you come back and say, one of the most fundamental important things for growth is innovating in zeros. Give me other companies that have innovated in zeros and become super big. Anyone? Facebook, no cost for journalism. Alibaba, today the world's biggest retailer, does not have inventory cost. Airbnb, no cost for um, hotel rooms. Uber, no cost for drivers, no cost for cars, valued at 95 billion US dollars. It's a goddamn app. What about a company like Google? What did they do? Every night they go out and crawl the web, download everything they can find onto their own servers, and then they sell advertising on someone else's content. How did they get away with that one? So for me, as you hear, it's all about innovate, don't imitate. This is really, really difficult. It can, <clears throat> it can be done, but my suggestion is to rethink. And I maybe here in India you are at the stage, you're copying a lot of other models, you're driving it to the domestic market. But over time, I think you have the possibility of building you know, the next tech unicorns that address the world and not only the domestic market. I think we're just in the beginning of an era of change. But it comes to the perspective, are you a game changer? Are you willing to rethink the things based on driving customer acquisition, creating a great delight, and then innovating in zeros? Because those are the three fundamentals of the companies that really explode. Or are you just an outperformer? You want to make your existing model a bit more efficient. That's fine, but over time, you could be in a really, really cheap challenging position, because I think you need to be really, really honest with yourself. Are we challenging? Are we challenged? Do we need to change, and how fast is change? Because my perspective is, if change is around the corner, you need to adapt quite quickly, because today the investments are just bigger and bigger. And then you say, okay, Jonas, is great. You know, you come here, you talk about your three ways to success. You know, how, what should I really do with this? Okay. Fundamentally, it's only three things that you need to ask yourself. I think Simon Sinek says this quite well. What are you selling? To who? And how? And in the end, why are you doing it? My 12-year-old son can answer this. It doesn't have to be more complicated. What are you selling, Philip? I'm selling cookies. Okay. To who and how? I'm selling it to the people that enter the local community train every morning. Okay, that's fine. Why, Philip? Why are your cookies going to be better than Unilever's cookies? Why are you going to capture the whole world? And then he just looks at me and says, no, we have to because we're going on a class journey. Okay. Normal parents would have given up there, but I can't. So I'm, Philip, how have you innovated in zeros in this business model? We talked about it. We talked about the importance of innovating in zeros. And then he thinks for a while and he comes to the conclusion, if mother buys the cookies, I make so much more. Yes, Philip, you just found your first zero. Thank you very much. That was all for me. Thank you so much, Jonas. I mean, those were some hard-hitting truth right there.
Uh, well, we have a question for you. Um, yes. We would be delighted if you would answer the question for us. Uh, well, you spoke about delight. And the question is what delight might stand for today uh, is a habit tomorrow. And e commerce deliveries, car rentals, holiday homes, and these might be some of the other innovative products that we have. Some of the new businesses that start on customer delight soon become a habit and then the delight disappears. So what do you say to such businesses and how do they keep the delight quotient always high? I think it's a very, very good question. I think the challenge for every entrepreneur, CEO, board member is to constantly think what is tomorrow's delight and how do we rethink what we're doing today? Because it's so easy that you become complacent. Um, and you start optimizing. And I think Skype is a good example. They started adding a lot of features, and the market just wants a sim even more simple product. So sometimes it's actually delight, it's actually going against the normal engineering perspective of adding things. It's about taking away things and making it even more crisp. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to request our Next presenter, Mr. Sam Sara, to kindly come on stage and present a token of appreciation to Jonas. Thank you so much. That was a great conversation. Thank you.